I do want to get to the latest here out of the Middle East as we are following more breaking news and you're taking a live look over Gaza right now. The Israel Defense Force is saying several soldiers have been injured in a drone attack on a base in the western area there. Hezbollah reportedly claiming responsibility for that attack. In the meantime, there's heavy fighting across Gaza as there has been over the past several weeks as the war is now in its third month. This comes as the U.S. blocked the latest international push for a ceasefire, vetoing the United Nations Security Council's efforts to end the fight. The U.S. also pushing through an emergency sale of more than $100 million worth of tank ammunition to Israel. Mark Chandler is the director of government relations at Coastal Carolina University and professor of practice. He is also a senior defense intelligence official joining us live now to talk more about all of this as he normally does on Sunday mornings. Thank you so much for taking the time as always to be here with us. You're quite welcome, Josh, and thanks for having me again. I appreciate it. Of course. Well, first off, the big question here, as we know, these Israeli soldiers have been injured in an attack by Hezbollah. It is important to know that the attacks are not just coming from Hamas, but also from Hezbollah. Yeah, Josh, I think that's important. And unfortunately, you're seeing it live today happening now. And I think when we look at this, we have to realize the broader context. Hezbollah, a, a historic enemy of the Israelis, you know, will continue to fire from the north and attack. And they've actually increased the level of these attacks in the last several weeks. They, they weren't Im impaired, if you will, by that ceasefire, by the pause in operations. They did continue to attack. But, but if I can pull this back just a little bit, you know, Hezbollah is 100 percent supported by Iran. And so when we look at that, we look at the broad, broader context. Iran is definitely trying to keep Israel unstable, the, the Middle East unstable. And if we shift all the way down to Yemen, you know, we saw continued attacks this week from the Houthis attacking commercial shipping. Three commercial ships damaged. The USS Kearney had to come to, to their aid and shoot down a couple of uh, drones that were going after them. And I believe this morning or overnight, even a French frigate had to get involved and shoot back at some Houthis. I think it's telling uh, when we're not doing anything to the Houthis, they, that would be easy to target and take out several of those targets. I, I can tell you for a fact that Iranian advisors, most likely from the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps, are there with the Houthis. The Houthis do not have this technology. So when you look at that, you know, something needs to happen. And I believe Netanyahu actually said that if someone doesn't take care of the Houthi challenges, you've got the attacks from the north and Hezbollah, you've got the Houthis attacks, you've got the fighting in Gaza, and even the U.S. Embassy was attacked by Iranian-backed uh, militias in Baghdad. And I do want to go back to what we were talking about kind of off the top here as the U.S. has vetoed the U.N. resolution that demanded a ceasefire. Can you kind of break down and explain what exactly that means and the response worldwide to that move? Because this is something that has been discussed a lot, especially over the last 24 hours. Yes, and, and thanks for that question, Josh. I think understanding that and the context is important. So when we look at that, Article 99, it gives the Secretary General of the UN uh, the option to bring a, a, a proposal, if you will, before the Security Council condemning some sort of action in the concern of global peace and security, maintenance of global peace and security. So when we look at that, it's only been done a couple of times in the history of the UN. The latest couple were in the Iranian Revolution in 1979 and during the Lebanese Civil War, Civil War which we saw Lebanese Hezbollah fighting back in the 80s. So look at the historic context. But in this situation, it was brought before the Security Council against Israel. So demanding a ceasefire by Israel. Now, let me break down the Security Council just real quickly. There are 15 members of the Security Council. Five of those are permanent members who have veto authority. And those five permanent members are the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Russia, and China. There are 10 other rotating members who, who bring a, a certain period of time that they're allowed to sit on the Security Council but don't have a veto authority, if you will. So when we look at this, United Arab Emirates, who is actually one of the rotating members during this time, 
brought the formal proposal for the ceasefire before the Security Council. There were three votes for that, one vote no, and one vote in abstention. And so the vote no was the U.S., and the abstention vote was the United Kingdom. So when you look at that, the, the resolution is dead. The primary purpose for the U.S. voting no, as stated, was the fact that this only focuses against Israel, a ceasefire Israel, does nothing to condemn the Hamas attacks on that. And you kind of mentioned this here, but what about the UK abstaining from the vote? What does that say and what is the significance of it overall? Well, what I would say is US and UK are, are strong allies working together. And I think working behind the scenes, the UK knew the US would vote no. So they were safe enough to vote with an abstaining vote on that. The, the UK is in some significant challenges right now with a lot of anti-Israel protests taking place. I mean, they're into the tens of thousands on the streets of London. So I think balancing the domestic situation, the UK could kind of walk that fine line of still supporting Israel, but trying to balance some domestic challenges that they are facing there, particularly in London itself. And another development, the U.S. also approved the sale of tank ammo to Israel amid the war. What does that mean for the war itself, and what does it say about America's involvement overall? Well, let me first step back on that ammunition. We have a long-standing treaty with Israel to provide them munitions. It's a great military partnership that we do that. We have continually been supplying munitions since the beginning of the fighting. The specifics about tank munitions shows that they are definitely using a lot of tanks for close-in fighting in this urban environment. But, but if I step back a little bit, we have also provided a lot of precision munitions and what we call bunker buster bombs. Those to allow for precision strikes and especially against the vast tunnel network that Hamas has in there. So when we're doing that, we've seen that. In addition to that, thousands of artillery rounds. So Israel is definitely turning up the tempo and, and fighting significantly this and expending a lot of their munitions. If I can step back just a second, Josh, and talk about the munitions. So it was good to see that focused on tank munitions, but earlier in the week, Congress turned down the opportunity to continue military, uh, a financial military support to both Israel and the Ukraine. And I understand there were some border concerns in there. They want to match that. That's definitely a, a concern. But if we don't look at the broader strategic concerns about supplying allies such as Ukraine and Israel, I think the United States is going to have a tougher situation in the future against the, the global threat to the U.S. One thing that's interesting that we've heard a lot over the past several days from the Israeli Defense Forces is that members of Hamas are essentially uh, turning themselves in. They are surrendering to IDF soldiers. What is the significance of that? A lot of images have been floating around the Internet here of that actually happening. Yeah, Josh, I, I would like to say that that's good news and would mean the end of the fighting in the near future, but, but it really doesn't. I think what you're seeing is the results of successful IDF operations. You know, last week I talked about how the IDF had secured a large part of the North. They, they haven't completely secured that. There's still fighting taking place. But when we go back in a, just a couple of weeks to the end of the pause, I think what we see is that Hamas realized it was able to, to militarily move its forces around. So we're in some significant fighting at this time as the IDF has focused further south to where Hamas has moved. There's an extensive tunnel network down. So specifically about the surrendering, no, I, for context, Hamas probably has 15 to 20,000 combat forces still available to fight. That's about the size of a U.S. Army division. So that's a lot of folks in an urban environment that are continuing to fight in one of the most difficult combat situations that you can face. So I don't think uh, giving up of a few, uh, surrendering of a few fighters is significant. And, and you mentioned something about images floating around. Josh, I, I've seen a lot of things floating on social media about those uh, Hamas fighters who were, were get, who gave up or other folks 
These are military age fighting males. What That's what we call them in the military. And, and what you see them stripped down to just their pants or underwear, I know graphically that looks uh, disconcerting, but what I have to tell you is that is standard procedure when you're fighting radical terrorists. Uh, we learned that lesson the hard way in Iraq, the U.S. did, uh, because you never know who has a suicide vest, who's hiding explosives in there, and the radical terrorists will blow themselves up. So that's a that's a security precaution. That's not anything demeaning to the people and not meant to be. That's to keep your own forces alive. So just in context, that's that's what we're seeing out there. Well, and I'm glad you bring that up because that's a question that's been asked time and time again of, you know, why are they stripping down? So that makes sense and provides a little bit more of an explanation of what's going on. So I appreciate that. Now, the number of Israeli soldiers also continues to rise as to the number that have been killed. The son and the nephew of the Israeli war cabinet minister, even among those soldiers who who have died. And it looks like, as I mentioned, we're about uh, maybe 100 Israeli soldiers that have died in the fight. And that number, as you imagine, only expected to rise. Yeah, Josh, the last count I got, I think we're around 400 Israeli KIA and around 1,200 WIA wounded in action and, and killed in action. And I, and I think what we're going to see, unfortunately, is those numbers are continuing to rise. I, I talked about how Hamas has withdrawn to the south and how the fighting is going to be extremely intense and deadly in, in this engagement with Hamas as they continue to resist. And, and so I think what we're going to see as Israel has increased the tempo of its operations, you're going to see, unfortunately, uh, more dead on both sides as this goes out. Many of the concerns that are brought up include the Palestinians saying that they have nowhere to go as Israeli troops are moving further south into Gaza. They are now essentially all over the Gaza Strip. Does it seem that Israel is giving the Gaza civilians enough notice and information on where exactly to go? Is there anywhere for them to go? Well, that, that's that's a little bit to unpack there, Josh. So so in context, I've looked at this and I've tried to see what the Israeli military is doing for the civilians. And, I, and it may seem counterintuitive, but I actually have to tell you, they're doing more than Hamas is doing. They're giving them warnings of where the fighting is going to take place. They're giving them evacuation routes. They're giving them the opportunity to withdraw. Now, now, what this does, though, it also telegraphs to Hamas where the fighting is going to be, where Israel is planning to take its next military action in those areas. So when you look at that, it's, it's actually counterproductive for the Israeli military to do that, but it shows that they're, they're trying to create humanitarian opportunities for the Gazans to flee, for the Palestinians to flee. Hamas isn't letting them. Hamas is, is using, continuing to use hospitals, mosques, schools from which to fight and the refugee camps. So they're embedding themselves all across the civilian populace. And if they can keep that, they'll generate more casualties. That creates the backlash against Israel in the, in the public forum. And so you start to look at this. So, yeah, I do think Israel is trying uh, the best it can within the context. Now, as for where the Palestinians can flee and where the Gazans can go, that's a major question and a dilemma. They can't leave Gaza. Uh, when you start to look at, at, say, the Rafah crossing into the Sinai, Egypt doesn't want Palestinian refugees on their land. They do not want to take on the potential terrorist threat, the potential challenges that bringing hundreds of thousands of Gazans into Egypt would cause, nor do other Arab states. So it's the Palestinians are stuck. Uh, in in not having a place to go, even though the Arab states are speaking out against the humanitarian crisis, they're not allowing anyone into their country for fear of similar actions by Hamas against those states. My last question here before I let you go, and it's kind of a, a tough one. It's maybe a loaded question, but we've heard a lot of information that has come in over the past two months since the war broke out. What do you think is the biggest misconception about the war that Americans, people worldwide do have right now? Well, Josh, you weren't kidding. That is, that is a tough question. Uh, but let, let, me, let me say that I, I make this clear. If Hamas 
were to lay down their arms, surrender, and turn over those 137 remaining hostages tomorrow, this round of fighting would stop. It would immediately stop, and I think you could see resolution moving forward. This isn't against the Palestinian people. And I think there's a lot of misconception, uh, the fact that Hamas, whose who's charter, it, its basic instinct, everything it has is to wipe Israel off the face of the map, is to kill all the Jews. But And they started this on October 7th. And so I think when we try to group in the plight of the Palestinians into what the Hamas terrorist organization, we're, we're kind of conflating two issues that don't necessarily relate. We have to look at, at the total terror campaign that Hamas is doing. And they're backed by Iran. You see this throughout the regional aspects that you touched on in, in, when this interview started. So you have to go back and I think look at that. And, and I hear through this lack of understanding you know, a growing anti-Semitism across America, but also across the globe. We we just need to go back to the early stages of World War II and what the Nazis were doing to the Jews and how the world kind of turned their head into the sand, if you will, and didn't want to pay attention to what's happening. So I think there's a big misconception on really what Hamas is about. They're not the Palestinians. You know, Israel was coexisting with the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and trying to allow them some self-governance opportunity when Hamas turned everything upside down. And so we in America need to understand that. We need to step back and look at the total context, which which unfortunately we, we fail to do sometimes. If I go back 22 years to 9-11, when a terrorist organization called Al Qaeda wanted to wipe America and Americans from the face of the earth. We turned and, and focused on fighting and defeating Al Qaeda at that time. And I, I wonder if we have short memories of just the threats that we can face. And when we step back and we look at Hamas, it's not just about Israel, it's not just about the Jews, but it's about this radical form of Islam and Islam, Islam that they are gonna focus on pushing forward. And I, I think we need to look at that in context as you start to see chance of from the river to the sea, which is about the eradication of Israel and the Jews. And we've talked about that a lot because that is a controversial phrase and a lot of people who are saying it don't necessarily understand the meaning behind no. it. Yeah, Mark they absolutely Chandler, do not. They definitely don't. Mark Chandler, thank you so much as always for taking the time to join us here on Sundays as we break down the latest developments. I mean, honestly, at this point, by the time I let you go, there may be another development. So this just, you know, continuously happening over the last two months. Thank you again for taking the time to be here.